Good morning. I'm Muhammad Sabri Muhammad Rawi, and welcome to the Leaders Room, brought to you by the Eclif Leadership and Governance Centre. Today we have with us the MD and Group CEO of Aziata Group Berhad, and uh, but prior to this, he was the CEO of Maxis Communications and the MD of Digital Equipments in Jiran Berhad as well. He is a member of the National Innovation Council, chaired by the Malaysian Prime Minister, and also currently is a member of the INSEAD East Asia Council. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you, Dato Jamaluddin Ibrahim. Dato, welcome, thank you for coming, and thank you for agreeing to spend some time with us this morning. My first question for you today, Dato, is when you were first appointed as MD and President of uh, Aziata, skeptics were doubtful whether you would make a difference. But in less than three years, you have transformed Aziata into a darling of the stock market and the analysts at large. Similarly, when you left Maxis, you left it at its zenith. How did you consecutively transform two companies into highly successful organizations, Dato? Please share with us your secret. Frankly, there's no magic. In fact, that's the word I want to use. There's no real magic uh, at all. And there's no secrets at all. It's all about getting the right strategy and be coherent about it mm -hmm. and getting the right people. Uh, again, as you've seen, uh, every, every book, every, everyone talks about the same thing. But let me, let me uh, perhaps elaborate a bit. When you talk about strategy uh, in Maxis uh, and be coherent about it, let me illustrate. So in Maxis, for example, you know, we, then we wanted to build a premium brand. And right from the start, right, it's the core of the whole strategy. So what does it mean? It means uh, getting the right people, pay them competitively, maybe way above others perhaps. Uh, the brand itself, you, build, you invest a lot in a brand. So a lot of people say you want to build a big brand, but you don't want to invest in a brand. So you, you invested then a lot in a brand. And even our advertisements, we, we don't have silly people looking so silly and really degrade the brand. You've just seen so many ads that uh, it's okay for some ads as some product because that's, that's the kind of nature they want, uh, the kind of uh, brand proposition. But if you want to have a premium brand, you don't have silly people look funny but look, look so stupid. That degraded, that will degrade the brand. Uh, so these little things like this are very important. And similarly, when we build customer center, we build, uh, we hire the best people and make sure we have the best customer service, uh, best cu physically the best customer center, the best service, and so on and so forth. And even when you outsource, you're extremely careful. People like the word outsource for the wrong reason. Uh, if you want to outsource to reduce cost, it's fine. But if you are a premium brand, you don't necessarily want to reduce cost per se uh, because at expense of uh, customer service. So all these things must jive, must be coherent. Uh, and then another, in, in the case of uh, Zeta, one of the key strategies we have is uh, the first major decision we made was to grow organically instead of inorganically. Right. I think uh, I inherited a pretty good set of uh, footprint. I think DM has done an excellent job to build a footprint. So my job then I look, my, I look at uh, uh, the uh, operation and say, you know, the best thing now is not to expand aggressively, but to nurture what I already have. No point in expanding when you don't have the best organization. Uh, the best performers in all the respective markets. So what we did were to, um, again, to be coherent, if you want to do that, to, to make them perform and get the best team. So we make a major revamp. Within uh, less than two years, 50% of top management team across all the groups were kind of uh, uh, changed or uh, basically changed, right? Uh, we have a new set of management team and some were, not because they were not good, but they, they, they were sent to some other places where they can fit in very uh, better uh, for the company, for them. So, and then we, we pay competitively, you know, despite being GLC, we managed to attract and pay people very competitively. Uh, we I mean, you have a good set of people, you empower them, and so on and so forth. See, I hope you see what I mean, that you know, this is uh, being, having the right strategy is one thing, but being coherent about it is even more important. And, and again, uh, the second part is getting the right people in the first place, right? Uh, getting the right management team, uh, motivate em motivated employees. So if you can see, you know, it applies in all cases and just a matter of being uh, the execution and being coherent about it. Yes. Um, Dr. when you were first appointed, um, I, I remember you describing it as a, as a call for national service one more time and express your reluctance actually to assume this position, mm -hmm. stating that you'd rather spend time with your family and do other things that are also of, of, of great interest to you. So how do you put aside that emotion <laughs> now and finally yeah. get to focus on the job at hand and do a very fantastic job at, uh, yeah. at the end of the day as well? Well, thank you. You know, um, 
I've sacrificed a lot of my personal time, family time during my days in uh, before in Maxis, and even before Maxis. So when, when I wanted to leave Maxis, I said, you know, enough is enough. I wanted to have a, a break. Uh, and at the same time, perhaps then, we was looking at something new and different. Okay. And maybe not too uh, time consuming, affecting both my personal and family life. That was the idea. But of course, you know, uh, what made me change my mind was the fact that um, it was a national service, you know, and there was dangling from me, you better do this <laughs> for country, okay, okay. And also because I, I, one thing I really wanted to do is uh, develop talent, uh, people talent, and, and I think that I could contribute to the nation in a different way to develop talent. And I was told that I could use Azeta, uh, then at TMI, yes. as a platform to develop people, not just in Malaysia, but across the countries that uh, we operate. Uh, so I thought, wow, okay, that's maybe a good platform. And of course, then the, the, the first prerequisite was to get my wife's permission, so to speak. We all, we all do. Yes. Yeah, but <laughs> in this case, especially so because I told my wife, I know I want to uh, spend time with the family. And uh, I think, and I make it very clear, if she didn't agree, I wouldn't have accepted the job. Now, to pass further that, uh, that itself helped me to kind of get away from that e emotion of uh, doing something else, right? right. Having said that, you know, when we created this vision, I got excited with the vision. When I, I, I could imagine uh, just days before I joined what we could do with this company. And I think the, um, the, uh, the, our chairman, uh, who's also the, our shareholder, uh, uh, Tan Sri Osman, uh, well, gave me one single, one, two words uh, of uh, mandate, make this company a regional champion. And I thought about it. I said, wow, maybe we could do that. Maybe uh, we could turn uh, a GLC to regional champion, a local company to regional champion. I, I guess that got me excited. And when I think and think about it, you know, bef before you know it all, I was here and built the company again. Okay. How many kids do you have, by the way? I have six. Okay. Six, uh, from very small to uh, pretty to, uh, well, thirty years old or thirty right. plus years old. It is hard to to get yourself away from uh, your family uh, when they are that the stage of the development and growth, I suppose. Very hard, yes. Um, and you travel a lot because of your job. Um, you probably have traveled thousands of air miles overseeing different companies. Mm. As you now is like in six or seven or eight countries now. Yeah. Um, on the subject of personal energy, how do you keep your energy levels high? Yeah. We are in nine countries and uh, it has been uh, quite uh, challenging right. uh, traveling quite a lot. Yeah. Not just to these countries, but for you, for you to stay on top, I have to travel to other places too, right? Uh, to Europe, to US, and we have to do a lot of traveling because of uh, investor relations. I do a lot of that and meet all the investors uh, across the world, uh, again, in, uh, mostly in Europe, uh, this part of the world, and also in, in US. And uh, I'm also a board member of GSM worldwide. Right. Uh, uh, so we have our board meetings also uh, elsewhere uh, outside this region. So back to the question, um, it is very challenging. If there's one thing I don't like my job is traveling, frankly. Yes. And I've been very clear I don't like to travel. I try to, you know, when I travel, I reach certain places, I try to get over whatever meetings I have to do and come back as soon as possible. Yes. So in a way, that allows me to, um, to minimize the time away. But having said that, I still spend almost 50% of my time outside Malaysia. Um, That's a lot of time. A, a lot of time. Yes. And uh, so what, what I'll do all the time is that to minimize whatever I could and to spend to avoid traveling during weekends. Mm. How do you keep your personal energy level high? Do, do you have a special regime that you go through every morning? Or <laughs> share, share with us. Actually, uh, well, first I have to keep fit, right? Sure. So I, I do spend some time uh, keeping fit. Uh, I do go to the gym or you know, running on uh, jogging or running uh, at the same uh, once in a while, perhaps about two, three times a week. Not enough for sure. Uh, only be because I'm traveling, because I'm not very uh, disciplined when I travel. But bottom line is, you know, I, I do keep reasonably fit. Right. That's very important. Um, the other end is uh, all about the, you know, the uh, when people say about vision, right. uh, internalizing the vision. Right. I guess I've internalized it to the extent that I said I want to achieve that vision for the company, for the country. Uh, so and that, that, that you certainly energizes me. When, you know, sometimes we are down, say, okay, I'm so tired. When I think about it. Gosh, but I want to make this company a great company. And that keeps my adrenaline going again. 
I think that sounds fantastic because innately we also believe that there's only so much that physical energy can do for you. Yeah. You know, after that, you, you need to tap into other sources of, of energy. Correct. And usually it's the emotional, is a, is a spiritual yeah. energy that... that uh, that's right, that yes. That's, that's fantastic stuff coming from you. Um, well, on the subject, on the topic of diversity, because you're in nine countries now, how do you go about managing various teams in these organizations in these different regions? Yeah. It's not easy. When, uh, when I, m I manage uh, Maxis and pre prior to that in other companies, right. uh, it's uh, pre predominantly one country and yeah, you, have the, you have the pulse, uh, you can feel the pulse because you are there physically right. most of the time, right? And uh, here we have nine countries, it's almost impossible to get the same kind of pulse. So again, to be uh, there for you is again no secret about it. Uh, just the concept that we build is we build a framework and that framework is about agree on the overall strategy of the company, each of the rel uh, all the operating companies, agree on a uh, couple of uh, HR principles and philosophies because it's extremely important to us. How do you manage people? How do you pay people? Uh, how do you uh, measure and you know, get them uh, motivated? And uh, some financial discipline and principle. So this is how we manage how uh, finance, uh, how do you uh, measure returns and so on and so forth. And governance. So those are the four principles within the framework that we right. develop. And then we have a mechanism to uh, what we call performance management processes yes. and system. So how do you manage the uh, performance? And empower them. And uh, that's how more or less how we do things. And I think it, it comes with the overall concept of situational leadership. Yes. Right? I'm, I'm sure you're very familiar. And this is uh, actual situational leadership at its best. Exactly. because. Yes. You have the you empower them. You have the overall framework, but there are times when you have to back off even more because they are doing extremely well. Uh, there are times when you need to come in, ex you know, uh, and micromanage to some extent because they are not doing as well, or there are a couple of issues to be to be resolved. So it does vary, but bottom line is empowerment. I think it's fantastic because I think your your, your subscriber base is now in excess of 200 million. Is that correct? About 220 million. 220 million. Wow. As a Malaysian, I have to say, I'm. I'm I feel very good about it. I feel very <laughs> proud of what you have, uh, about what you have done so far uh, with uh, Asiata. But, uh, um, coming back to the, um, the issue about spirituality and, and emotional energy and things like that, would you say that spirituality plays a big role in the journey as a leader? Does it, does it position you, or does it provide you with the right balance and center as a leader? Absolutely. It, it has to be, right? Uh, because it's, you know, there's a physical world, there's every, you know, everything, a material world and all that, but you need the spiritual uh, world or spiritual feeling uh, to guide your conscience uh, to drive you at the same time, right? And uh, it's not just about conscience, but to drive you, give you the energy that we talk about. But I must profess, you know, I'm far from being religious, if that was you, man. I'm still working on it, but. We all are. Yes. <laughs> but, being, you know, but coming uh, from a spiritual as a, as a driver, that's certainly uh, very true. Um, friends are important to you as to our, you know, um, uh, the humanity of us all. Uh, and I heard that you do keep in touch uh, with many of your friends still. Uh, it was said that you would go the extra mile, he says here, for your friends and subordinates. In a world where many leaders have no close friends, would you cite friendship as an essential component of leadership as well? Um, if, you look, uh, if you look at the, the broader concept of leadership, it's about influencing people. Right. It's about uh, building relationship with your peers, with your subordinates, uh, with everybody you work with, and also people externally, uh, and being uh, always on touch, uh, in, in touch with the ground, so to speak, right? Sure. So if you think about it, uh, therefore, friendship allows you to do that, right? F firstly, it, it, you, ha you know, it gets a good practice. You, know, you can't tell your friends what to do, right? Can you influence them what to do? Uh, friends give you feedback that your sometimes your peers or your subordinates won't give you, right? right. Um, and friends also uh, allow you to uh, keep in touch, so to speak, on uh, what's happening on the ground, right? I know I have friends, frankly, uh, from high-ranking people to men on the street. So and I love it because you know, uh, especially the people who are men on the street, because ordinary people, and I feel very ordinary. Uh, just like anybody else, you know, it feels good. And I guess at the end of the day, it's also friends allow you to kind of an outlet for you, right? You know, after a hard day's work, 
the last thing you want to do is to talk about job, about work, yeah. right? right. <laughs> so it gives you that outlet, so to speak. So is it, it's not so lonely at the top now, after all, is yeah. it? It's quite lonely sometimes, but you, you can't share everything, right? right. Yeah, if you want to uh, do something, you want uh, sometimes you can't really share with any, especially when it involves people, right? You want to replace people, you want to move people. There's a very few people you can talk to to do that. Finally, my last question to you today. Yeah. Uh, some may say that you have a charm life. I do too. I agree with that. Um, a lovely wife, six children, a few grandchildren, to talk it up, great friends, and you are a very successful and well known corporate personality. That's what you are. How do you manage it all? Is it possible to have it all? Because I have been told it's not. But apparently, I was wrong. So, yeah. challenge your secret. Please. First, I'm, I'm lucky to have uh, a good family. Very lucky. Um, you know, I don't think it's possible to have them all. Uh, you can't uh, expect that. Yes. I think that's a, a, a first mindset because trying to have it all in every sense of the word is extremely difficult. So if you're um, trying to uh, work 12 hours, 15 hours per day and trying to have them all, almost impossible. But having said that, it's possible within the constraint of whatever time I have is to optimize, quote unquote, whatever you have, uh, whatever I have. So, you know, I make sure that, uh, for example, I, I travel a lot, as yeah. I mentioned earlier, um, and I work 12, more than 12 hours easily to sometimes 15 hours per day. But during weekends, is the, the opposite. I try to minimize, if, if not, try to not uh, have a lot of work or even zero work at all. Mm. So I, I try to avoid travel. Sometimes I, I can't avoid, for sure. But in many cases, I try to avoid. Um, Meetings, if I really have to do it, you know, it's like Saturday morning, and that's it. Right. If I really have to do it, but most of the time, I don't have meetings during weekend. Uh, a bit of work, I try to do it, maybe Sunday evening, but I try to make sure the weekends are quite free. Yeah. And I had to sacrifice too, because I used to play a lot of golf uh, every week. I now don't play golf every week anymore. Uh, I only play golf when I travel with friends. Has your handicap right? suffered as a result? Uh, of course, you know, yeah. of course. But, you know, I play golf more for the, the enjoyment of the company rather than golf itself. I see. So I don't play much golf. And, and you know, there are uh, certain things that I have to do to adjust. And also to balance it a bit, perhaps uh, I make sure that there are important events, uh, family uh, events or my kids' events, you know, their sports day. Uh, I will try to be there almost all the time, maybe not all the time. Uh, school results, I try to be there many times, but maybe not all again. But those are the kind of adjustments uh, that I have to make to balance a bit. Not a perfect balance, but I would say uh, a reasonable balance between work and life. Not so easy. <laughs> That's fantastic. If yeah. there's anything you would do differently in your life so far, the one thing, is, is there such a thing? What would that be if there is? Sometimes I do think about it. What would have been different? No, I, I, I can't even think of what would it be. I'm, I'm contented with my job, my, my, you know, in my life, and there's nothing more, more I could ask for. Thank you, Dato, for your time. Thank I'm you. That you have uh, agreed to spend some time. Thank you. I'm honored to Thank be you. here too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Muhammad Sari, Muhammad Ravi again from the Eclipse Leadership and Governance Center, signing off from the Leaders Room. Thank you for watching.